So I, so I'm back to running. Okay. <laughs> and it seems like when I'm exercising, a lot of my illustrations kind of go that way. I didn't, I don't mean for it to be that way, but that's, that's where we are today. Okay. The, uh, the title of the message is our spiritual muscles, our spiritual muscles. Um, and it's going to take maybe a little while to get back to this text, but let me real quickly go over what's going on in this text that he just read. Hopefully you're able to follow along, but this is the story, the infamous story of David hiding out in the cave. Um, it, it, while he's in this cave, Cave Adullam, he uh, writes several wonderful psalms. You know, uh, a while back in Iola, I preached a series on the psalms. I can't remember what I called the title, but they were the different psalms in in the book of Psalms that have descriptions. And so what we did is we looked back at the stories uh, that the song, the description talked about, and then kind of looked at the psalm and saw what we could pull out from that, you know, event that happened. Anyway, so there were there were like three of them, I think at least, that made reference to this his time in this cave, which shows me that while he was in there, you know, he had a really he had a lot of time of reflection, time of searching, time of getting back with the Lord, and uh, he wrote these uh, these great psalms. While he was in there. But before this, in uh, chapter 21, look at verse t- chapter 21, verse 10. <clears throat> you know, he's here's a man that's been victorious. He's killed the uh, the giant Goliath, you know, and he's he's defeated the, these armies and everything seems to be going well. And then all of a sudden the king, King Saul, is like out to get him. And he's frustrated. He's fleeing from him. He doesn't understand why he's, he, what has he done to make this guy mad? And, uh, and then he ends up kind of uh, going to this town, trying to get away. And he goes actually to the place uh, that has Goliath's sword. Even like, like there's a historic place, you know, this is where he defeated uh, Goliath way back. And, and, uh, and, and so verse 10, David arose and fled that day uh, for fear of Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servant of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did not he sing uh, one to another? Uh, did not they sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David is ten thousand? That's like this, this jingle that went around the land, and everybody was singing this about David. and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. Okay, so he's reading between the lines thinking, "Uh uh-oh, they think that I'm here for the wrong reasons, and they're surely going to turn on me too. And so he's living in fear. He's on the run. And so what he does while he's in fear is he's like, i got to figure out a way to make sure that Achish doesn't, uh, uh, you know, kill me or something like that. And so verse 13, he changes behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands. And scrabbled on the doors of the gates. I'm guessing, you know, like a mad, just a madman. Scrabbled on the door of the gates and let spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see, the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of mad men that ye have brought uh, this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Uh, Shall this fellow come into my house? And so basically he's able to get away because he's like, okay, he doesn't want anything to do with me because he thinks I'm mad. And so he flees, all right? And then he ends up landing in this, this cave. And while he's in this cave, it seems as though he becomes a much better person. He has time to reflect. Like I said, he has time to get things right. Uh, and he begins to seek the Lord. Look at chapter 22, verse 20. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, or I don't remember how Justin pronounced it. He pronounced it differently than I did. He's probably right. Escaped and fled after David. And and Abiathar uh, showed David and Saul uh, that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of the persons of thy father's house. It's like he's realizing the the gravity. Something happened like because of him, because his fleeing, because of his doubting, his unbelief, all these things, he had allowed an occasion that even all these godly priests were put to death. And he's just 
beside himself. And he says, Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh thy life, seek, uh, seeketh my life, seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safeguard. Now, if you read the Psalms and you read everything that just happened, you're thinking like, why would I trust you that, you, you know, I'm going to be safe with you. Uh, but, the, but the reason for that is what he got right in the cave. Okay, the, I'm just trying to lay out some, some real brief uh, uh, introduction here. Okay, look at verse 20, uh, chapter 23. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keliah, uh, uh, Kela, and they robbed the threshing floor. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Kela. Do you see a difference? David's not scared. David's not running. He's not fleeting. He's like, Lord, do you want me to go? And the Lord says, yes, go. And he says, I'm going to go. The same might that he had when he slew the Goliath, when he slew the giant, the same might that he had when he went after the armies with no fear, right? Because all of a sudden he was spiritually strengthened. He was spiritually, uh, you know, just filled with the spirit. And so what I want to talk about this, uh, this morning is that David, you know, he had a lot of ups and downs in his life, of course. We bring those up a lot. But he always ends up being a man after God's own heart. He always ends up being a man who humbles himself and does right and gets back to God. And look at 1 Samuel 13. We see that this is why God chose him to be the king in the first place. And this is why he was going to become uh, the king in Saul's stead because God saw him. Look at 1 Samuel 13. In verse 13, and Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment uh, of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, for now would the Lord have established thy, uh, thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So you see, God's heart was on David, and he said, he's a man after my heart. He's the man that I'm going to uh, give the reins. And of course, David becomes the great king, by which all the other kings, by the way, are compared to him. They're like, you know, he did wickedly, not as his father David, or he did good like his father David, whatever. He was like the standard. And even Jesus Christ ends up being... Uh, David ends up being used as a picture of Jesus Christ. And he says, hey, of his kingdom, it will be established forever and ever. And so uh, we see a lot of great feelings that God had towards David. Now I'll come back to this story here in a little bit. I was going to look like I'm departing from that, but uh, hopefully it'll make sense here in a minute. 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. Now, if you read the book of Psalms and you see the heart of David and you see, you know, again, man after God's own heart, you see a lot of reference to the heart. Okay. Now, I told you the title is Our Spiritual Muscles. The heart is a muscle, isn't it? The heart is a muscle uh, that's always working and all. But when the Bible talks about the heart, most of the time it's talking about a spiritual part of the person, the, his inner being, you know, his, his, his spirit. A lot of times when the Bible talks about the heart, it's that inward man that we're talking about. First Timothy chapter four and look at verse six. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. I love this analogy of exercising the body and comparing that to exercising the spirit or exercising thyself unto godliness. And a while back, uh, several years ago, I don't know how, many, how long it's been now, we did a youth rally in, in Iola um, that was called Exercise Thyself. And I had that little, uh, it's a, we have the, gave out these t-shirts, still one of my favorite t-shirts I got. Uh, I need to get some more made because we've changed our logo a little bit. But it's, uh, it's got that little heart, uh, let's say EKG, I think, where, 
I don't know what, what is the EK? Okay, so echocardiogram, right? Where's the K? Echo, if you look up a house spell echocardiogram, there's no K. I don't understand what EKG is. Maybe somebody can tell me afterwards. <laughs> so EKG is like the heart rate. You know, you got this line and then it goes dee, 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 right? And then on the top of it, it says, uh, I will have temple. And then it says, exercise thyself. And I wear that and I actually get, have gotten lots of comments while I'm out with that shirt. People, for whatever reason, they think it's, hey, yeah, that's a great shirt. Exercise thyself. And, uh, and the thing about that is, you know, because I, I mean, I remember thinking like, hey, that'd be a great name for like a, like a health club or like a, you know, a gym, you know, exercise thyself. But the funny thing about that, the ironic thing about that is the point is that it's not about the physical exercise, rather exercise thyself unto godliness. It's not that the bodily exercise isn't good. It is good, but it only profiteth little compared to what it profits when you exercise yourself unto godliness. Okay. And so, uh, spiritual muscles that we have, if you will, that need to be exercised. They need to be worked. Uh, these are the things that are the most important for us. Okay. And so by way of just kind of a, a, a illustration, I want to talk about three things, kind of four, four things that we need in order to build our muscles. And I'm going to compare that to our spiritual muscles. And then I'm going to give you on the fourth point as kind of the conclusion just an extra bonus point that is really the crux of what the message is about. But, um, but all of this is talking about our spiritual muscles. And I'm going to come back to the story of David here in a minute. <clears throat> all right, number one, our muscles need fuel, okay? Our muscles need fuel. Uh, they need nourishment. They need calories. Amen. You need to eat. God made you to need to, if you work, <laughs> if you burn calories, you've got to have fuel for those muscles, and if you ever seen somebody that just doesn't eat very much, they're skinny, they're weak, there's no muscles, they're just like skin and bones, and uh, they don't have that fuel because the bo the body needs the fuel and the energy for the muscles to be able to grow and get bigger and get stronger. Okay, and so that's a very important part of building muscles. Uh, there's a whole science to it. And there's discrepancy, there's disagreements in the medical, you know, in the sports medicine field and everything about what kind of calories to, to consume and this much protein or this many uh, uh, carbohydrates or whatever. But the bottom line is that you have to eat food. Now, now look, please keep making the, the you know, distinction in your mind between the, the physical muscles and the spiritual muscles, okay? Uh, but... In the physical realm, you have got to eat the calories in order to build the muscles. And this is why, like bodybuilders, they eat a ton of calories, you know, and they're just eating, eating, eating. And then uh, they lift the weights, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But they've got to have that energy or else they're not going uh, to build that muscle, okay? <clears throat> they, uh, one thing for sure, you have to have the food. You have to have the water as well. You have to be, you have to be hydrated in order to grow those muscles, okay? And then you need to avoid a steady diet of bad foods, okay? So like, this is the part that I need to work on. <laughs> so a steady diet of bad foods, what I mean, like, I've heard it put this way, like there are some foods, there are some foods that you should just make a life commitment. I'm just going to stay away from those foods. These are always bad. Like never, these are never foods. I'm never going to eat these foods, okay? You're thinking, well, which ones are those? Probably the manufactured, fake, you know what I mean, stuff. The, uh, I mean, if you, you want something, I mean, different people have, like, again, have different theories on this, but, but there's like, you know, the drinks with the aspartame, you know, hey, the sugar is probably better for you than the fake sugar. So all that fake stuff, you know, that might be something that you'd put in that list and be like, hey, I'm just never going to touch these. And then there are some foods that are like, sometimes, sometimes it's okay to have a cookie. Praise the Lord, Thursday nights, cookies. Thank you, Sharice. Uh, we got the cookies. It's okay to have a little cookie every once in a while. Uh, some cake, you know, something nice, uh, as long as it doesn't have a lot of that fake stuff in it. And, uh, and so uh, and so this is like, you know, sometimes you get that. And then there's like what you want the majority of your food to be. This is the this is the most, this is where you get your nutrition. This is where you get, you need the fruits and the vegetables. You need the the proteins and the, you know, the good meats and, the, and all this kind of stuff. You got to have the, if you just live on a diet of these bad junk food and fake foods and stuff like that, you'll get weak, lethargic, 
sick, your muscles will be injured, you'll have lots of injuries and all that. God designed us some pretty miraculous bodies, and I'm talking about the physical bodies that we live in, not to even mention the spiritual. But it's pretty amazing how he designed it, but we've got to eat, we've got to eat good foods, and, uh, and we've got to uh, keep working on uh, you know, feeding, those, providing those nut that, that nutrition. Now, when you're a baby, you drink milk. It's very good for you. You grow. I mean, it's hard to imagine that Viviana has got to the size that she has just on her mother's milk. Uh, you got the little roly-poly legs and, <laughs> and all that. And uh, that milk is doing her really good. If you lived on that for 40 years, you know, well, that's kind of a gross picture, but you know what I mean, like drinking milk, <laughs> not, not that way. But anyway, if you drink milk, right, there's some good things about milk. Milk's good for you. But if you just drink milk, that's all you drank all your life, 40 years, something like that, it's not going to go so well for you. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, how many of y'all like cereal? Be honest. I mean, you like the cereal, the sweet stuff, the whatever. <laughs> yeah. So I've known people who live off of like, hey, just get a bowl, put some cereal in there, put some milk in there, eat, the, eat that down, and that's their that's their breakfast. The majority of that is just the milk, which, yeah, you're going to get a little bit of protein, you're going to get a little bit, but if you live off of that, that's not really given the nutrition that your body really needs. Now, some of you in your mind, you've already made the, you know, you've made the application. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk. If somebody just got saved, or maybe they were saved a long time ago, but just recently started getting back into God's Word and wanting to grow, we expect that like a newborn baby, they're going to desire that sincere milk of the Word. They're going to desire to know something about their Bible. Uh, they're going to desire, you know what, I need to read my Bible. Or maybe they hate reading, but they'll say, you know, I'm going to listen to the audio Bible. Or I'm going to listen to preaching. Now, look, I don't ever think that listening sh to preaching should be a substitution for your own personal Bible reading. I think you need to get into the Word and re receive that and learn how to read it and learn how to soak it up and, and, uh, and, and, and all these things. Okay, but the time comes where... There has to be something more. Just that, that milk like you had when you were a baby isn't enough. There has to be more. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were able, you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For, you're all, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you uh, envyings and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? And walk as men. <clears throat> For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by uh, which he believed, even as the Lord giveth, uh, gave to every man? I planted, a wall, a, Apollos watered, but God give the increase. Okay, so the, the bottom line here is he's saying, look, I keep, I fed you milk because you couldn't handle any more than that. They say, but now I'm watching you, and I'm like, you're not growing. You're still carnal. You're still living in the flesh. You're still spiritually weak. And uh, you guys, there's the divisions among you, and you're like, well, I'm of Apollos. And the other guy's like, no, we're of, we're of Paul. And he's like, you're missing it. You don't have the meat. You don't have the real nutrition, and so you're spiritually weak. Okay, You don't have the nutrition that, and the fuel that your muscles need, Okay, that spiritual muscles need. You're not going to get strong with just drinking a, a, a bowl of milk with a little bit of cereal, <laughs> okay, uh, you're not going to get you're not going to get strong that way. And the same is true spiritually speaking. If you, if the extent of your taking in spiritual nutrition is listening to an occasional sermon, it's 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 it's, it's good. It's good. Like milk is good for you, but it's not really going to help you build those spiritual muscles. You need a lot more than that, okay. And so you need to be reading your Bible. You need to be comparing Scripture with Scripture. It's important. 
you know, start trying to figure some things out for yourself. Try to grow. Try to, uh, uh, you know, uh, let these things kind of sink, sink in and give you the spiritual nourishment that you need. Uh, learn to memorize scripture. Man, I wish I could, I wish I would have memorized more when I was younger and I wish I could retain more now that I could memorize scripture because it's so important. And then to be able to meditate on those scriptures, that's one of the reasons it's so important to memorize scripture because any time of the day you can just pull these, these verses up to your mind and just meditate on them and bounce them off each other. I love the fellowship uh, here, like uh, after uh, services, a lot of times we'll sit around. Hey, what do you think about this verse? Next thing you know, we're, we're talking about different things that we've reflected on during the week. You know, we went on hikes and I know that uh, Brother Justin and I have, uh, have talked about certain verses or he's he's asked me certain questions. And I'm like, I don't really know. I got to go look that up and maybe I'll preach a message on it someday or something. And uh, but it's interesting stuff, right? Because we're all trying to grow. We're all trying to feed our, our, our soul, you know, and our spirit, this food that it will help us get spiritually stronger. We have to do that. We need to try to learn some of the deeper truths of God's word. Now, I don't mean you got to be able to rightly divide every verse in the Bible and put this here and put this there. And, and you got to know what the numbers stand for. And you got to know most of that's garbage. <laughs> okay. Most of that is just people trying to read something that's not even there. You know what that is? That's like, that's like a diet of ice cream. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not even, that is not. Nutritious stuff is actually knowing, you know, what you can get out of not sitting around, you know, just playing with scriptures and making this say this and, 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 and look, isn't this fancy? Look at what I figured out. No, no, no. The application is what's going to make the difference. Actually, that that word of God got into you and is able to make uh, is to make a difference. We need to feed ourselves the spiritual food. OK, number two. Muscles need to be. All right. It would be great if we could just sit around and eat all day and get stronger, but it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> you sit around, you can eat all the calories. See, this is always my excuse. Now I eat a lot of junk too. I got to be honest, but <laughs> my excuse is in the times of my life where I'm working out and I'm like doing lots of running and I'm trying to get fit and I'm just like, I need all those calories and you're hungry. Your body's hungry and it's starving, uh, uh, craving all those calories. And so I'm eating all the calories but then there comes a point where maybe I got an injury or something like that, so I'm not running anymore. Maybe I pulled my shoulder, so I'm not lifting the weights anymore or whatever. I'm just sitting around. But guess what? Still eating all the calories. <laughs> You're gonna, it's not going to work, all right? Your muscles, yes, they need the calories, but they not only need the, uh, the, that energy, they actually need to do something. The energy needs to be used for something. And so they, you need to go lift some heavy stuff. You need to go exercise them and push them and, and, and put them to the test. This is the, uh, the reality of what those calories are used for, what that nutrition is used for. We need to be able to put God's word into practice. It does very little good in here. Now, it will do you some good, but what really is going to help is whenever that is actually put to the test. What you learned can then be exercised, okay? Okay. Uh, Here's something that I think is, is overlooked a lot of times, okay? In our spiritual life, I've already mentioned, you know, we're talking about the food. We're talking about reading the Bible and learning the doctrinal things about the Bible and stuff like that. But, you know, there's a spiritual element that is often overlooked, and that is stuff that happens in private. That's stuff that happens when nobody's looking between you and God. So, you know what you need to add to your, your life, your workout routine, if you will, your spiritual workout routine? You should add a lots of prayer, you should add lots of private prayer. I'm not talking about prayers to be seen of men getting up. And no, Jesus talked about that. That's not what he's interested in. But actually exercising those spiritual muscles. You know, I, I made jokes about this when I was younger. Like, man, I need to really work on my spiritual muscles. And what I meant were my knees. Because I'd get down to pray, you know, next thing you know, my knees are hurting. <laughs> but that's a physical, right? I'm not, who cares about your knees? I'm just saying that, you know, the idea of sometimes, you know, let us, let us have a little walk, uh, walk with, talk with Jesus. You know what I mean? They talk about the sweet hour of prayer and all that. Man, I remember as a kid thinking, I don't know. I just always hear about this hour of prayer, right? And there's no number. There's no special number that has to be. But I remember thinking like, what and what it feels like to pray for an hour. And I would try to pray for an hour. And about 20 minutes into it, I'd fall asleep. <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> and I'm like, man, I need to exercise that time. Now it's got to be meaningful. I'm not talking about just vain repetition or something like that. It's got to be meaningful, but to be able to build that relationship where you're communicating with God is secret. Not everybody can see that, but you're actually exercising those muscles. The muscles are going to get stronger because you're spending time in God's will. You're thinking about God, you're thinking about uh, uh, what he would have you to do. You're praying for other people and all these things. That is actually putting your muscles to the test. Take time even to sing praises to God. That's a part, uh, again, overlooked a lot of times in somebody's uh, spiritual walk is just singing praises. This is commanded in the Bible to sing praises. we got a whole book of psalms and, uh, and of course, We've got songbooks. We've got a bunch of songbooks over here. Uh, if anybody does, you know, wants a songbook to take home, uh, I would start with the red ones. Uh, they, they got the tape on it just to, just to get rid of those first, I guess. But uh, it's got good songs in there that you can sing to the Lord. You can get familiar with them online. You could look up almost any of those songs, and there's probably an a online uh, you know, a choir singing it or a congregation singing it. And just sing along with it. I know a lot of you guys do that. And I've seen some people share their uh, kind of like a playlist, you know, of old hymns and stuff. And, the, and, they, and they love the hymns. Yeah, do that. Practice singing that in your car, you know, sing it. To, yeah, people driving by might think you're weird. But look, they're doing it anyway. They're picking their nose and they're singing to themselves. Who cares? You sing it to the Lord and, uh, and exercise those spiritual muscles. But then the obvious stuff would be like actually using what you know to like preach the gospel to people. That's, that's huge. That's, that's exercising those muscles. Uh, you know, uh, it would actually be like doing things for people, investing in people, helping people with things. Uh, you know, these are ways to, to use those uh, muscles. Look at uh, Acts chapter 14. The Bible has a whole lot to say about this, and it's something that the average Christian you know, doesn't want in their life. And the carnal Christian will do everything to convince you that that's not what God wants for them in their life. But that is trials and tribulations, even persecutions. Okay, you need these in your Christian life if you're going to grow. You won't get stronger if you don't have the trials and the tribulation. You just won't because there's nothing to be tested, you know. In, uh, in Illinois, we were, I was talking a little bit about the endurance and talking about the Christian life and how, you know, it wouldn't be an endurance. I was making reference to the potluck 50 that we did there. And I was like, it wouldn't be called an, an endurance event if there wasn't some pain that you had to endure through. You know, so you can't expect it to just be something that's just fun the whole time. You have to have some suffering. You have to have some pain. When you're lifting weights, you have to be doing that extra uh, set, you know what I mean? And an extra rep, like the first 10, first rep, maybe you do 10 pounds. Uh, I mean, 10, I'm sorry. The first set you do like 10 reps and you're like, Oh man, that wasn't so bad. And the next one, man, you're feeling it and it's really hurt. And you're like, I don't want to do anymore. Yeah. Well, that's when the growth starts. And then that third rep where you're like, I can't hardly even lift it up and you're grunting. Arrgh. Guess what that is? Trial, tribulation. That's work on your, that's a workload on your muscles. It's called, uh, I, had to, uh, I had to write it down because I knew I'd forget, uh, hypertrophy, hypertrophy, right? That's working the muscles, putting that workload on them until it like almost like muscle failure, it hurts. I'm telling you this, if you want to grow as a Christian and you've asked God, help me grow as a Christian, he will let you go through these things. You're like, well, then I'm not praying for it. Well, then you're probably not going to grow. You have to go through tribulation. You have to recognize whenever it comes and say, all right, this is a test. God wants me to get through this, to get to the other side of this so that I'll come out a better person and a stronger person spiritually. All right, and so Acts chapter 14, verse 22. <clears throat> after they preached the gospel, I shared this a lot. I know it's uh, not new to anybody, but uh, after preaching the gospel, he would go back by and he would confirm the souls. It says, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples in exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we uh, must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And then when they had ordained the elders in every church, they prayed with fasting, commending them to the Lord on whom they believed. Okay, so he went back to teach these new believers, guess what? You are going to have to go through some 
dark times. You're going to have to go through some rough times, some tribulations, some tests. Uh, uh, you know, it's not just like, hey, hey, man, now that you believe in the Lord, your life is just going to be grand. Well, not until you learn how to go through the tribulation. Now, I'm not talking about the tribulation. That's another message. Okay, but I'm talking about tribulation in our life. Yeah, we, we're going to have we're going to have some serious tribulation one day. But I'm talking about right now tribulation of just everyday life. And look, if someone tells you, hey, Christians don't go through any tribulation, they're not reading the Bible because Christians go through tribulation. That's, that's appointed unto us. We have to, you know. We don't want to. And it's not like if you avoid it and you chicken out and you don't want to go through it, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means that you're weak spiritually. You, you, you haven't learned how to grow and go through those tough times. We all need that. We need it more uh, than we think. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace whereupon we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience uh, experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We've got to have that putting the spiritual muscles to the test. We've got to have the uh, hypertrophy. That's probably not, I'm probably not pronouncing it right, <laughs> whatever it's called. Number three, number three, our muscles need rest. Our muscles need rest. This is important too. A lot of people gung-ho about exercise, gung-ho about lifting weights or going running or whatever. And you know what happens if you've ever tried it and you go out and you're like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to, I need to really lose this weight. I really need to build these muscles. And you go out and you push and push and push and push with no rest. You're going to burn out. You're going to want to quit. You're going to get injured. You know, you're going to have uh, uh, some rough times and it's not going to go so well because uh, you didn't allow your body to get some rest. Okay. The more you exercise, the more your body can adapt. I'm talking physically speaking, but spiritually, I think this is true as well. The more you experience you have, right? The longer you've been a Christian, to put it in the spiritual application, the longer you've been a Christian, the more, the, the easier it is to recover. You know, you don't need the rest quite like you did. Like, so, you know, when you start working out for the first time, you are totally sore the next day. The day after that, you're even more sore. You know, the third day, you're sore, but it's getting a little bit better. And uh, maybe the fourth day, you can go out, work out again, right? Because you're just starting. Your body hasn't learned how to adapt to that. But after the experience, after the muscles are getting stronger, you work out, you may be a little sore the next day, but then the next day, you're fine, you know? At some point, you get to where you can have a little bit of soreness and still be recovering and all that kind of stuff because you have experience. Now, in your Christian life, it's the same way. There are new Christians that go out there just gung-ho. Man, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to give this up. I'm going to start giving all my money. I'm going to start doing all these. And it's great. And you never want to stop somebody from doing that because you're like, well, praise the Lord. They love the Lord and they want to do something. I'm glad for that zeal. I'm glad for that passion. But in the back of my mind, I'm always like, whoa, whoa, buddy, you're going you're gonna to overdo it. <laughs> you're going to overdo it. And the time's going to come where you're just going to be like, you know, not coming to church and falling back into sin because you're like, I set too, too high of an expectation for myself and I couldn't do it. Or there's going to be some kind of injury. There's going to be some kind of a, a time that you, you, you're just like, I just, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this was a bad idea. Maybe I really shouldn't have uh, uh, started this, you know. <clears throat> you get an injury. Uh, there's a saying that they have in the running world that's like you either have an injury you're just recovering from an injury or you're fixing to have an injury. It's like you're just always running injured. <laughs> okay. And I'm sure other uh, professions, I mean, other types of exercise, they say the same thing. When well, the Christian life is kind of like that too. You just got to always know, man, there's something. It's like, oh man, everything's going really good. Uh-oh. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, who's the next person that's going to leave? Who's the next person that's going to get mad? Who's the next person? Uh, you know, it's just how it goes. That's the Christian life. And we need to uh, allow ourselves 
the rest that we need. And we need to allow, if we're an experienced Christian and we're like, no, man, you can do this. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Understand not everybody's in the same spiritual capacity that you are. And there are people that need a little bit more rest. There are people that can't lift heavy weights. You know what I'm saying? I hope you guys keep making the analogies uh, in your mind. Okay, um, so things will get better, uh, but you've got to, you know, don't, don't shame church folk who might have missed a day for some reason, or they might have, uh, you know, had a moment where they got in the flesh and they, and they said something or did something, and you're just like, oh, man, don't just hold that against that person forever. Look, they, you know, they're still growing, they're still learning, and, uh, and I'm not saying it's ever right to, to go sin, like that's not the type of rest that I mean. I mean just sometimes they have to like slow down a little bit and not uh, not just go full force the whole time. I hope that makes sense. Look at First Kings nineteen. I love this. Uh, I love this story. I learned a lot from this. I don't feel like uh, I think again. It's I think maybe experience. I've kind of learned how to deal with with some of this, but I don't feel like I go through a lot of times of depression or times of like, you know, woe is me. My life is sometimes I feel guilty because I don't have enough, uh, you know, things and trying things in my life. I feel like that anyway. Right. But there have been some times where maybe I didn't even really realize it, but maybe I couldn't sleep quite like I used to sleep or my wife started recognizing that I'm a little on the edge or something. And I'm like, man, what's going on? Well, there's probably some ministry related stress or something going on, you know, some some type of tribulation or whatever that maybe I wasn't even thinking about. And that can kind of sneak up on any Christian, you know, no matter how long you've been a Christian, it can kind of sneak up this depression or this like just, man, I, I, I don't know what happened. But but you just you just you hit a low. And when you read the story of Elijah, man, Elijah is just. I mean, he's on fire. He's like standing in Ahab's face and he's like preaching at him. He's challenging like the 400 prophets of Baal, mocking them. <laughs> Come on, call on your gods, you know. And he's like, he's not afraid of anything. He's calling down rain. If you could call down rain from heaven or shut up the rain whenever you prayed and God would just shut up the rain, it seemed like you wouldn't be really, you wouldn't be scared of anything. You'd be like, man, I'm not scared. God's on my side. I can just call up this anytime and, and boom, boom. It's kind of like David. Like there's a one, you're like, David, you stood before the giant. David, you, you fought off all the Philistines. You killed tens of thousands. Why all of a sudden do you have to run to this cave? And, and why do you have to, you know, uh, mask yourself like you're, like you're mad because you're afraid that this guy's going to try to fight you? Just stand up and fight him. God's on your side. But no, God doesn't treat him that way. And God didn't treat Elijah that way. Let's see what God does for Elijah. Look at 1 Kings 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, uh, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he request, requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Now, I've never been that depressed. <laughs> I've just never, I know a lot of people who have said, I don't even want to live anymore. I've never been there. I've never been that low. Elijah, here's a man that was just on top of the world. I mean, God, God sent down fire from heaven and consumed a sacrifice. Had, he had poured all these buckets of water on it. And, and God proved himself that he is there and he's his God. And then he watched as all 400 prophets are, are, uh, are murdered. I mean, you know, killed for worshiping the false gods. And now here he is running from Jezebel. And he's like, that's it. I'm done. I don't even want, I just, I want to die, God. Just let me die. I've never been there. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. I'm going to tell you this, personally speaking, maybe this is true for everybody. If I ever do feel a little depressed or a little overworked, and kind of strained spiritually, there's two things that I go to, sleep and eat. <laughs> that's, 
that'll take care of it, right? And, and God knew that. He's like, he lets them sleep, and then, he, and then he sends the angel, and the angel's like, arise. And, eat. and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. What do you mean the journey is too great for me? I want to die. Well, he obviously doesn't want to die. He's eating, right? <laughs> but he just feels like he wants to die. But the angel, like under the inspiration of God, it comes to him and he's like, you know what? Just get some rest. Okay, now wake up. Now get some more rest. Now wake up and time to eat because you're about to go on a long journey. And so what he's saying is, hey, don't give up yet. You still have a whole lot more to do. But go ahead and take a time to rest. Go ahead and take a time. Now, look, in your life as a Christian, and then this is true, again, physically speaking, you're trying to lift weights or do an exercise routine or whatever. There's going to have to be a time where your body rests and gets some sleep and gets just, you know, let it recover a little bit so the muscles will, will, will heal. But spiritually, it's the same thing. And God knows that. God's not like, why did you miss church? You got to go do this. And why did you not do this one thing? Why oh, you miss visitation? Oh, sorry, soul winning. <laughs> you miss soul winning habit. You miss soul winning. You know, uh, you know what, what's going on? God doesn't do that. No, he wants you to give everything that you can give. But sometimes he's like, you know what? Why don't you rest for a couple days? Because there's a whole lot more work for you ahead. And if you get burnt out now and quit now, you know, you're not going to be useful down the road. So go ahead and rest a little bit, but then get right back to it because you've got a whole bunch more to do. So it kind of makes me think of my Thursday that's kind of a bad example because because I'm really not doing so great on my diet. But I said Thursday will be my cheat day. I come here Thursday. I can't pass up all the good food. And so, man, I'm going to eat that with the mindset that, hey, the next day, you know, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to work extra hard and push it. And so it's kind of that's kind of spiritually how it is. Sometimes you have this moment where you're like, man, I, I feel like I kind of missed you know, I should have put a little bit more effort into my soul winning. Or For me as a preacher, sometimes I feel it in my preaching. It's just like I feel like it's going downhill and it's not as exciting. I haven't put as much effort into it. And, uh, and it's like, you know what? I'm not going to like just be down and be ready to quit. I'm just going to say, hey, this is, this is going to pass. I'm just gotta, I just got to have a moment here to fill up. And then the next time I'm going to go, and there's a long journey, and I'm going to give it 100%. You know what I mean? But I've got to get there. And so sometimes we all have those moments where we have to get that rest. God doesn't get mad. God didn't get mad at Elijah. He sent the angel and said, just rest, just eat, eat a little bit more. <laughs> now go out and do the work. Now you can't just take the rest if you're not going to do the work. <laughs> you can't just be like, you know, I think I'll skip another day. I think I'll skip my Bible reading again. I think I'll skip soul winning again. No, you're going to have to do the work to deserve the rest. <laughs> You know what I mean? You're going to have to go out there and uh, do the work. Okay. And then uh, number four, just obviously real quickly, repeat the process. Have to get the rest, get back to the good nutrition, get back to the hard work and uh, get back to uh, uh, just that whole cycle. Okay. But here's the bonus point. Look at Psalm 57. Sometimes that little rest turns into a big fall off the wagon. <laughs> You're like, all right, man, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna break a little. All right, this is this is me in my running illustration. Okay, <clears throat> all right, man, I just ran 50 miles, whatever. Uh, I'm not done. I'm gonna get back to it, but you know what? I'm gonna just take some time off. Next thing you know, I've gained 40 pounds. <laughs> I can't run and I can't, I can't get my oxygen levels back up and all this stuff. How did you get to that point? Well. <laughs> The, the, the main thing is not like, oh, man, how did I get this far? The main thing is get up and do it again. But here's a point that I want to make. Your body, your physical body has an amazing thing called, this is my limited knowledge of, of you know, uh, physical therapy or whatever, but your body has an amazing thing called muscle memory. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with what that is. <laughs> if you worked out years before, and then you stopped and you got out of shape and you just look like the average couch potato or whatever. And then you go back and you start working out again. You know, it's not going to be as hard for you as it was for that person who's never done it before because you've got something called muscle memory. 
Your body's like, you know, I've been through this before. I remember this. This is why those, those uh, I don't know if you remember a show a long time ago called The Biggest Loser. And uh, they tried to lose a whole bunch of weight. And they'd get this big team. And these guys are like really fat. And they're like, what a little trick they don't tell you. Most of these people on there, like they know how to get in shape. And they just allow themselves to get really big. They just kind of quit working out or whatever. But when they start working out, the reason they can do it so well, they can lose so much is because they have muscle memory. Like if, no, if somebody had never done that before, they probably wouldn't be able to lo lose as much and to be as strong, you know what I mean, uh, without injury and stuff like that. But they have muscle memory. Now, this is why this is important for us spiritually. <laughs> it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you're going to fall in your Christian life. You're going to fail. I mean, hopefully it's not that bad of a fail. Hopefully it's not something that's going to like wipe you out or hurt, change the whole uh, the way that your life looks or something like that. But at some point you're going to be disappointed with your spiritual performance and you're going to be like, man, I messed up. I let that get away from me. Uh, I got out of shape spiritually and I don't know what to do. Well, here's what you do. Get back right into it. And allow God to use that muscle memory to get you right back to where you were and then go above and beyond that. You know what I mean? And just and then do the work that you're supposed to do. But it's an amazing thing. Look at Psalm 57. <clears throat> Psalm 57. <clears throat> Look at the description. To the chief musician, Altashith, well, I don't even know how to pronounce this, Miktam of David, when he fled from Saul, in the cave. Here's David's psalm. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I, take, will I make my refuge, until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up, Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are, are, are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue as a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are uh, fallen themselves. Selah. But look at this here. He says, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Now, I don't mean it's fixed like it was broken and now it's fixed. I think what he means here by fixed is it's steadfast. It's solid. It's unmovable. Well, look, he messed up once, yes, but he's got that muscle memory. He's got that spiritual ability to say, hey, I messed up. I fall. You know, the righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. Uh, you know, I've fallen, but my heart is fixed. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. David was discouraged. He went to the cave. He said, what's going on? I don't understand. Probably felt like he just wanted to die. But as he stood there and he went back to his, his practice of seeking the Lord and meditating on his word and thinking about that and giving it to him, singing praises to him and, uh, and exercising those spiritual muscles, he realized he had that muscle memory. He had that good foundation, that strength that says, I can do this. And he said, hey, I'm not, I, I became weak, but now I'm going to get strong again. He realized the harm that he had done to himself and the harm that he had done to others. And he said, look, I, I don't want to do that anymore. And so he's able to step out of that cave, dialed in and just, and just ready to go again to the point where he, he talks to the very people you know, said, hey, he comes, the son of Abiathar, I, I think I'm saying that right. He's, his, he comes and he's like, hey, uh, you know, the, the prophets, they've been killed, right? Because Saul was seeking him and they said, hey, you guys provided him some refuge or whatever. And he killed all those. David's like, man, I gave occasion for these godly men to be slain. 
And then he looks at the guy. Here, he's hiding out in a cave himself. He's running from all these different people. And now he looks at this guy and says, you know what? The ones that seek my life, they seek your life. Stick with me. You'll be safe. Why? Because he's wrecking the right mind. He's back in business, and he's like, I'm serving God. And then you find in the next chapter, he's like, God, what do you want me to do? You want me to go up to battle? He says, yep, go up to battle. Okay. And he goes up, and he's strengthened again, and he's ready to do business. Let's pray. Father, help us, for we know that we will, uh, we will fall short. We will mess up. We'll get in the flesh. And this is why so much of the Bible says, uh, r- reminds us of that and tells us uh, to get back up. And, and uh, we know that we'll enter into sin. We know that we'll give in to the flesh in different ways. Father, uh, some people will even enter into a time of discouragement or depression. And I pray that you'll help us as brothers and sisters to look out for one another and recognize uh, when somebody needs a little bit of rest or a little bit of uh, uh, time to get refreshed. Uh, but if anybody uh, gets too far gone and, and realizes that they've got out of shape spiritually, Lord, I pray that you'll help them uh, to fall back on that muscle memory and that they'll continue to have their heart and their soul fixed on you and ready to do business and, and ready to preach the gospel and ready to, uh, uh, to just sing praises to you and worship you and to love people and all the things that you've called us to do, Lord. I pray that you'll give the strength to do that. Fill us with your spirit. Bless this work here in Kansas City. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.